Revelation chapter 20, verse 1 is where we'll start reading. It says, And I saw an angel come down from heaven, having the key to the bottomless pit and a great chain in his hand. And he laid hold of the dragon, the old serpent, which is the devil, and Satan, and bound him a thousand years and cast him into a bottomless pit and shut him up and set a seal upon him that he should deceive the nations no more till the thousand years should be fulfilled. And after that, he must be loosed a little season. And I saw thrones and they that sat upon them and judgment was given unto them. And I saw the souls of them that were beheaded for the witness of Jesus and for the word of God, which had not worshiped the beast, neither the image, neither had received his mark upon their foreheads or in their hands. And they lived and reigned with Christ a thousand years. But the rest of the dead lived not again until a thousand years were finished. This is the first resurrection. Blessed and holy is he that hath part in the first resurrection. On such the second death hath no power. But they shall be priests of God and of Christ and shall reign with him a thousand years. And when the thousand years were expired, Satan shall be loosed out of his prison and shall go out and deceive the nations which are in the four quarters of the earth, Gog and Magog, to gather them together to battle, the number of whom is as the sea, sand of the sea. And they went up on the breadth of the earth and compassed the camp of the saints about and the beloved city, and fire came down from God out of heaven and devoured them. And the devil that were deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone. Y'all got to say amen right there. I'm looking forward to those smutty face being cast in the lake of fire. Oh, devil. It has caused us all that trouble. But let's go on. Aware the beast and the false prophet are and shall be tormented day and night forever and ever. And I saw a great white throne and him that sat on it whose face the earth and the heaven fled away and there was found no place for them. And I saw the dead small and great stand before God and the books were open. And another book was open, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged out of those things that were written in the books according to their works. And the sea gave up the dead which were in it, and death and hell delivered up the dead which were in them. And they were judged every man according to their works. And death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. And whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. Let's pray before we get started. Kind and gracious Heavenly Father, I pray that you'd speak to the hearts of everyone in this congregation this morning. And Lord, we all have need to hear this sermon. Uh, there may be some here who need to hear it and trust you as their Savior today. There may be some lost here in the congregation. I pray that they'd be found in Christ today. And Lord, for those of us who are saved, I pray that you'd give us a solemn reminder of why God left us here on earth. Help us to remember, God, that you left us here, that we'd be witnesses for you. And see as many folks saved as we possibly can, that they avoid this great white throne judgment one day. Lord, I pray that you'd be with me as I preach. Anoint these lips of clay. Remind me of the things that I should say and withhold anything from my lips that I should not say. I pray if there's any sin that would hinder me of being used, I pray you'd forgive me that I may be meet for your use this morning. It's in Christ's precious name we pray. Amen. Amen. Now this chapter, this is a chapter I've got to return to every once in a while just to remind myself and remind the congregation of how serious our work is here upon earth. To remind us how serious it is to know that you know the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior. It's a very serious thing. And it's taken very lightly. But we've got to return to it. And I do this out of love. I don't preach on hell because I like preaching on hell. Matter of fact, I really don't like preaching on it. Uh, but you people need to know what the truth is. After all, Jesus said the truth will make you a what? Free, the Bible says. Uh, so I don't enjoy it, but it's in the Word of God, and it's a truth that everyone needs, so it's going to be preached from this pulpit time and time again. It's a word of warning. If you're not saved, you're going to split hell wide open. If your loved ones are not saved, you better witness to them because if they leave this world without Christ, they're going to split hell wide open. A preacher that doesn't preach that and a preacher that doesn't warn about hell is what the Bible calls a hireling. Doesn't care for the sheep. As a parent, 
uh, warns a child of the same danger time and time again, even so a preacher should warn about hell time and time again. I mean, if I had a dime for every time I left as a teenager and my parents said, be careful, I'd have a pretty good uh, padded bank account right now. And as a parent, I find I do the same thing. Be careful, because I care, I warn, I try to make them think about these things. And likewise, a preacher will his congregation. Uh, Jesus, by the way, warned constantly about judgment and about hellfire. I mean, Jesus himself said, if your arm offend you, cut it off, or cast it from you. It's better to go through life with one arm than to go into hellfire with two. Jesus warned about hell. He's, Jesus said, fear him who can cast uh, the body and the soul into hellfire. Talking about fear him. Fear God. Be saved. Jesus uh, constantly warned about hell. You'll find Jesus preached much more about hell than he did about heaven. He rarely says anything about heaven, but he's constantly warning about hell. Amen. And if Jesus would do it, certainly the church should. But I believe that no other Bible doctrine is more neglected or more distorted than the doctrine of the great white throne judgment of what we just read here in Revelation chapter 20. This is a judgment that deals with the unsaved. Now the Bible does not teach a general judgment. Do you know what I said? You know what I mean by that? I hear this preached often. I work at a funeral home, so I hear all kinds of bad doctrine. But I, I hear preachers say, we're all going to stand up there and God's going to separate us at, at this great judgment. The sheep will be those uh, that did enough to get into heaven. The goats will be those uh, who didn't. That's called a general judgment. There's not a general judgment taught in the Word of God. There is no judge, the judgment for the Christian happened 2,000 years ago upon Mount Calvary. Christ took our judgment for us. But I got news for you. If you don't put your faith in that sacrifice he made, you will stand before this great white throne judgment and you will be judged according to your works. Amen. Not to see whether you get into heaven or into hell. No. Everyone who stands at that judgment will be condemned. Everyone who stands there will be condemned. As a born-again believer, Jesus took my place. Now, this doctrine of judgment has been distorted. I believe uh, well, one of the main reasons for that is this, that a recent generation has gotten uh, an unscriptural idea about God. Um, people in this generation will say, well, God is love and God is mercy. He would never send anybody to hell. You ever heard somebody say something like that? If somebody says something like that, they've not read their Bible thoroughly. Sure, it does say in 1 John 4, 8, He that loveth knoweth not God, for God is love. That's why he came and died for us, because God is love. Say amen. amen. John 3, 16, y'all know it. For God so what? Loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. But you can't stop there. The Bible also teaches that God is holy. And anyone who reads their Bible will come to this conclusion. God loves sinners, but he hates and judges and punishes sin. It's God's nature to punish sin. That's who he is. That's why it says in Hebrews chapter 10, verse 29, our God is a consuming fire. Our God is love, but God is also a consuming fire. God is love and he extends his grace out to all those who will believe, uh, but he's also a consuming fire if you do not accept that grace. Amen. He'll be your adversary. That's why it says in Psalm 711, listen closely, God is angry with the wicked every day. He's angry with the wicked. If you're not saved, he's angry with you. You are uh, treading over top of Christ's precious blood that was shed for you. He offered his son and you've rejected that sacrifice. Think of what all his son endured upon Calvary and you reject that. God is angry with you. That's what the Bible teaches. But many people, they never read all the Bible. They just uh, like something because it sounds good. Now that's why Christ warned over and over again because hell is a real place. Now, the, the, there's good news though. 
Nobody has to stand at the great white throne judgment. Nobody has to. Everyone can be saved and avoid that judgment. You don't have to stand there and have all your sins uh, brought to your remembrance. You don't have to be taken and cast in the lake of fire. You can avoid that by putting your faith in Christ Jesus alone. Amen. It's all up to you. Now, there's some folks that say only a select few uh, uh, can be saved. No, the Bible's very clear that whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. I like the old song, whosoever meaneth me. You can be saved. Whosoever will, let him come take of the water of life freely. You can be saved and avoid that great white throne judgment. Now, what's this judgment all about? Well, in Genesis 18, 25, it clearly says, uh, Shall not the judge of the earth do right? Who is the judge of the earth? Certainly not me. God is the judge of the earth. He sets standards, and when those standards are not met, he judges. If he uh, uh, says that there's a penalty for sin, there's a penalty for sin. And if that penalty is death and the lake of fire, that's what it is. And if he provides one way of salvation, that's what it is. And he did through the Lord Jesus Christ. He's the only way, the only truth, and the only life. The judge of the earth will do right. In, in order to do right, he must be consistent with his attributes and punish sin. This message needs to be declared, doesn't it? We need to tell lost sinners where they're bound. We need to warn them to flee the wrath to come and find refuge in the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Well, after all, why not warn people? I mean, say for instance, you're in your house with your family. And you hear all of a sudden a high-pitched beep. And you probably know what that is. That's a smoke detector. How foolish would it be when hearing that smoke detector go off that you put your pillow over your ears and roll over on your side? That'd be a dumb thing, wouldn't it? Even if you might think it's a false alarm, it'd be worth checking, wouldn't it? But how much more foolish it is it when the Word of God says that there's hell fire awaiting those who believe not to ignore it and put your hands over your ears? Huh? I'm your fire alarm right now. I'm sounding that you must put your faith in Christ Jesus alone to be saved. Don't depend upon your own good works because when those works are stacked up against the holy God, they're not good works at all. So don't ignore it. Today, though, people have no fear of God. But they need to have fear of God. We need to tell them that there's a holy God up in heaven. They need to know. But I remember years ago we had some uh, kids paint fight to power on our shed down there. And I couldn't help but think I didn't even get mad. I felt sorry for the kids. Right. Because what power are they talking about? Right. If you're writing fight to power on a church, what are you talking about? You're talking about God. And I tell you what, you don't want to be God's enemy. You want to be saved by him. You want to be in his family. You don't want to be opposed to him. Amen. I remember as a kid, I went to uh, uh, Forestdale Baptist Church, and I, I remember it as clear as day looking at the bench, and somebody had, uh, carved a curse word in the, the wood part of the bench. And I thought, man, they don't have the fear of God. I remember in the eighth grade, I took a church track. It's a little a pamphlet that tells people how to be saved. And it said on the front of that church track, one day you'll stand before God. And I remember putting it on a kid's desk. And I remember look, looking in the floor after that, and he had scratched out God and put dog on there. And I couldn't help but think, even back then, that kid don't fear God. They're ignorant. They need to know that that God up in heaven is real and they, they are going to stand accountable to him. Right. These people mocking the Lord, they need to know that that Lord that they are mocking will condemn them one day unless they seek refuge under the blood of Christ. How are they going to hear that if we don't preach it? How are they going to hear that, Christian, if you don't tell them? Now, I'm not saying stand out with a sign and say you're going to hell. And that is the truth if they're not saved. But the Bible says on some have compassion, making the difference in Jude. Amen. 
Go to that person and tell them that you care for them, that you want to see them saved and you want to see them in heaven one day. Tell them that God so loved them that He sent His only begotten Son and that they can be saved and then warn them if the, what happens if they don't. Now, I, I, I hear things all the time where I think that people don't fear God. People use His name in vain. On television, they want to make fun of the Lord Jesus Christ. But I tell you, they don't realize what they're doing when they do that. They're casting dispersions on the one who so loved them that he laid down his life for them. The one who would save them. Now the doctrine of the judgment of the unsaved dead, though, helps us see God's attitude towards Christ's rejection. God doesn't take it lightly when somebody rejects his son and tramples his precious blood underfoot. And there's a great illustration of this. I've used it many times. You probably remember it, but I'll use it again for some of y'all who may never heard it. There was this man who took his son to work one day. This man happened to be a drawbridge operator. And supposedly this is a true story. But anyways, he was there uh, at this drawbridge doing his job that he, he did every single day. When a ship would come, uh, he would throw the drawbridge lever, the gears would work, and the bridge would pick up so the ship could pass safely underneath. When the ship uh, got done passing by, he would throw the lever again, the gears would turn, and the drawbridge would lower for a train to come over the top of it. Well, he, he was reading his paper, not paying much attention, and he realized it was time uh, for the train to come, and he needed to lower the drawbridge so the train could pass over the river safely. And in horror, though, he realized uh, that he had kind of lost track of his son, and his son was playing around the gearboxes. He did not have time uh, to get his son or to even uh, holler at his son. He had to throw the lever, and when he threw the lever, the, the gears crushed his son to death. And as uh, the gears crushed his son, he looked through the window and he saw the train go by. And in, that, in, the, in the windows of that train car, he saw people reading their newspapers and sipping coffee. And he couldn't help uh, but say, do you not care that I sacrificed my son for you? If he hadn't have threw that lever, that train would have crashed. And likewise, I can't help but think God up in heaven looks down to the one who rejects Christ and says, uh, do you not care that I sacrificed my son for you? I can't help but think too he looks at Christians in so much of the same manner. When we go about doing our own will instead of the will of God, uh, sometimes he, I think God might say, do you not care that I sacrificed my son for you and saved you? But yet we do what we want to do. Amen. You don't, you don't, do you not care that he gave his life for you? Do you not care of the great sacrifice that Christ made? Now let's look at this great white throne. Now it's kind of an introduction. Let's get to the sermon. Now, what, when does this judgment take place? This great white throne judgment. Now, there is a judgment that Christians will stand before. Uh, that Christians will stand before God in judgment too. But it's not this one. Christians will stand before the judgment seat of Christ. At the judgment seat of Christ, our works will be tried to see what sort they are, whether they be good or whether they be bad. We'll not be judged to see whether or not we get into heaven. We'll be judged whether or not we will have a reward, perhaps where we will be in his kingdom. And certainly crowns are talked about, and some of those crowns are cast before the Lord's feet. But that's not what this judgment is. This judgment is just for lost people. Now, when does it take place, though? Well, one day Christ is going to step off on the clouds. He's going to say, come up hither, or something like that. A trumpet will blast, and we will rise to meet the Lord in the air. There will be a resurrection. All those uh, who are in Christ Jesus, when they died, their soul is going to be with the Lord in the, in the air, and, and uh, that soul is going to reunite with that body, and that body is going to be changed in a moment. In the twinkle of an eye, it will be resurrected and fly up to meet the Lord in perfection. We are alive and remain when the Lord comes. We'll be changed in a moment in the twinkle of an eye and we'll be caught up together with them. A great reunion in the skies. I can't wait. I wish it happened right now. Amen. But after that uh, resurrection, that first resurrection, there's a time of great tribulation upon the earth. 
The Bible is very clear that it's the worst time that it will ever be upon the face of the earth. It's the worst time it ever has been or ever will be. I surely would not be, want to be left behind to endure such a thing, would you? But if you're unsaved, you will endure it. It'll be a terrible time. But then after seven years are complete, and there's much more to it than this. I'm just simplifying it. After that seven-year period, uh, the saints are going to come back with the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. You can read about that in the chapter just before the one I read. The Bible says, And I saw heaven open, and behold, a white horse. And he that sat upon him is called Faithful and True. And it goes on to say that the armies which were in heaven followed after him upon white, uh, white horses in fine linen, white and clean. That's the bride. That's the church. Amen. We're coming with him back. Amen. He's going to set up a kingdom on earth. And you can read about that in chapter 20. That will be a thousand years long. And we will rule and reign with Christ Jesus. The old Satan, no Slewfoot, is going to be chained for that thousand years. You can read about it in the text we just read. Amen. I tell you what, when they chain him up, the Lord will let me. I'm going to kick him. Amen. Amen. He's going to be chained up. And he's going to rule and reign. That's where you read about in the Bible where the lion lays down with a lamb. Amen. Instead of a house cat, I might have a tiger. But after that thousand years, the devil is loose for a season. And he goes out and gathers together a great army to fight against God. And they come up against God and they come up to that beloved city, which is probably talking about Jerusalem. And you know what God does? He doesn't even lift a finger. He just calls fire down from heaven and devours them. Right. And then the next verse, verse 11 says, And I saw a great white throne, and him that sat on it, whose face the earth and the heaven fled away, and there was found no place for them. So right after that, everything fades away, and here we have space and a great white throne setting. Now, let's talk about the throne of judgment for a minute. For a minute. <laughs> What a contrast this throne is, this great white throne to the throne that me and you came to, Christian. I came to a throne many years ago, and I got saved at that throne. That was the throne of grace. Listen to what it says, uh, Hebrews 4, 16. Let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace uh, to help in the time of need. And I can think of no greater time of need uh, than when I was lost as a ball in high weed. When I was bound for hell, it was a great time of need. But praise the Lord, when I came to the throne of grace, he saved me that day. Amen. And I tell you what, there ain't a day goes by that I don't have to revisit that throne of grace, not to be saved again, uh, but to find mercy Amen. in my time of need. What a great thing the throne of grace is. Amen. But here at this great white throne, there is no grace. This is not a throne of grace here. This is a throne of judgment. Because they have rejected the Lord Jesus Christ. There'll be no grace at this throne. There'll be no mercy there. There'll not be another chance. Because this throne stands for justice, purity. It'll be the great white throne. Amen. Now hundreds of years before Jesus was born in Bethlehem, Daniel saw this throne. He said in Daniel 7 verse 9, now listen closely. I beheld till the thrones were cast down. And he said, The ancient of days did sit, whose garment was as white as snow, and his hair of his head was like pure wool, and his throne was like a fiery flame, and his wheels as burning fire. All other thrones were cast down, but God's throne uh, stood. That's what Daniel said. And here you see that all the thrones of men have been cast down. They were cast down in Revelation 19. Now the God's throne stands. We see Nebuchadnezzar's dream where he sees this image and each one of those uh, parts of that image represented a kingdom. Represented thrones in other words. Well what happened to that image? A stone cut out without hands came rolling down the mountainside, hit that image on the toes and it just went into dust. Amen. Amen. And then that little stone began to grow and grow and grow and it filled the earth and became a great mountain. A great mountain in the Bible is representative of a kingdom. And what kingdom is that? That is the kingdom of the Lord Jesus Christ that will never have an end. Amen. Amen. No matter how great a nation is, it will give way and the great white throne will stand. 
Let's talk about the judge. Who sits on this white throne? Who, who's the one who gives justice and judgment? Well, God's a trinity, correct? You have God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. Separate but one. Now, I don't fully understand it, but that's what the Bible teaches, and I believe it. Maybe one of these days I'll fully understand it, but right now I don't. They're all, all God, and it ain't a ranked Godhead. You can't say God the Father's number one and God the Son's number two and God the Holy Spirit's number three. No, there's no order to it, no rank. They're all God. But anyways, you got it. God's a trinity, but Jesus is going to do all the judging. Do you hear what I said? Jesus is going to do Amen. the judging. Now, this is quite contrary to the way they like to portray Jesus today. They try to make him a sissy, don't they? Huh? They try, to procre they try to make him a joke. Yeah. Well, Jesus ain't a joke. Right. He was a sacrifice who died for you. He was meek and lowly when he came to earth the first time. But when he comes back, he is going to be the lion of the tribe of Judah. Yeah. And he's going to be the great judge who sits yeah. upon yeah. this great white throne, folks. Yeah. It says in John 5, if you don't believe me, it says, The Father judgeth no man, but hath committed all judgment to his Son. That's yeah. Jesus. That same Jesus that lay in a manger will judge the earth one day. He'll sit upon this great white throne and judge all those who have not been saved. The same Jesus who begged people to come to him and his eyes were a fountain of tears, that same Jesus is going to sit upon this great white throne judgment and judge all those who did not come to him. The same one who said, Come unto me all ye labor and are heavy laden, and I'll give you rest. will say to those who are unbelievers, Depart from me, I never knew you. Amen. The one that healed the sick and raised the dead and cast out devils showed uh, the mercy to the woman taken in adultery, the Lamb of God, the sacrifice for sin, the one who opened not his mouth when they mocked and ridiculed him or put up a defense. He is now the line of the tribe of Judah and he will judge all unbelievers. Are you one of them? You know, in Revelation chapter 1, verse 14, it describes the Lord, and it is described much as what we read there in Daniel. But one thing we read in Revelation is that his eyes were as a flame of fire. If you're lost, surely you're going to stand before those eyes that are a flame of fire, and those eyes will pierce right into your soul. You'll stand before him. Hebrews chapter 9, verse 27, listen closely. This is the word of God. It says, as it is appointed unto men once to die, after this, the judgment. The judgment's coming. It's coming. If you're lost, you won't stand. Now, who is it will be judged? Well, we've already went over a little bit, but let's go a little bit farther. Who is it that's going to be judged at the great white throne judgment? And here in Revelation chapter 20. Well, it's definitely not saved people. You say, why not, preacher? Why couldn't that be talking about a general judgment? Well, Romans chapter 8, verse 1 for 1, it says, Therefore, there is no condemnation to them that are in Christ Jesus. There's no condemnation with me. How can I stand before a white throne where all who stand are condemned if there's no condemnation? See, Christ once again was judged in my place. So who is it that stands at the great white throne judgment? Well, let's let the Bible speak for itself. Revelation 20 verse 12 tells us exactly who's going to be there. It says, I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God. Amen. Who stands there? The dead does. You say, well, what if I die before this judgment? Is that talking about me? No, it's talking about the spiritually dead. The spiritually dead. See, Somebody can be spiritually dead and their heart still be beating. It's a deadness on the inside. Let me clarify it a little bit with the Word of God in Ephesians 2.1. It explains, it says, You, talking to Christians, hath he quickened, that means made alive, who were dead in your trespasses and sins. You were dead in your trespasses and you're spiritually dead before you were saved. When you got saved, he made you alive. But you were dead. That's who it's talking about. The dead, the spiritually dead will stand before God. Right. You can go back to the book of Genesis and get a little bit more light on that. In the book of Genesis, God said to Adam, he said, The day that you eat of that fruit, you shall surely die. 
Now, listen closely to what he said. The day, the day you eat of it. He didn't say you will eventually die or you will begin to die. He said the day you eat it, you will die. Spiritually, he died that day. And he did God's grace. When a lost person dies, they go straight to hell. But hell is not forever itself. Now, that may throw you, but let me explain it a little bit. You go to hell. Hell is like a local jail that you go to await your trial. When you go to your trial, you will be convicted if you're guilty, and then what will happen? You will go to prison. Lake of Fire is prison. If someone dies now uh, without, by, without the grace of God, uh, if somebody dies today who's rejected Christ Jesus' so great salvation, they will go to hell. But one day they'll be called to judgment. Read about that in verse uh, Verse 13, let's read that. It says, And the sea gave up the dead which were in it, and death and hell delivered up the dead which were in them, and they were judged every man according to their works. Hell delivered up the dead. See, if you die without Christ, you go to hell, but then, the, then you'll come up out of hell one day to stand before this great white throne judgment. They'll be raised in the second resurrection. To stand before this white throne. We oftentimes preach about that rich man in hell. He's been there for at least 2,000 years. But on the second resurrection, he'll come up out of hell and stand before this great white throne. He'll be judged. It says in verse 12 that the small and the great will stand there. You ever, if you notice that our justice system is getting more and more uh, where it's uh, uh, some people have to obey it and some don't. You know, so we're getting a two-tier justice system. I mean, if you're a politician, it seems like you can get away with anything. If you're a politician, you don't even have to obey subpoenas. If I didn't obey a subpoena, you know what happened to me? They'd throw me in jail. Well, we got a two-tier system. It depends on who you are. You have no celebrities that's got away with great crimes because they were celebrities. I mean, in my mind, no doubt, O.J. Simpson killed his wife. You can agree with me or disagree, but that's my opinion. I think he got away because he's a celebrity. There's molesters. Right now, I mean, they know who it was that was trafficking kids to Epstein's Island. They know who it is. Why aren't they accountable? It's a two-tier justice system. But I tell you what, this great white throne judgment ain't going to matter who you are. Whether you're small or whether you're great. It don't matter if you was the president of the most powerful nation in all the world. If you're not saved, you'll stand there. It doesn't matter if you were a king that was in control of a thousand armies. You'll stand there. And you'll be judged. And the judge of the earth will do right. You're not going to buy him off. What are you going to buy off God with? Now you're going to buy him off with some money. Don't make me laugh. You know his city of the streets made of pure gold. You're not going to buy him off with gold, are you? Amen. You're not going to tell him how big a shot you are because you're a little shot. He's the one who made everything. Right. No bigger shot than God. They're all going to stand, small and great. Wicked men like Hitler, child molesters, and of that sort, they'll stand at the great white throne judgment, but likewise... Uh, there'll be uh, good men stand there too who are moral. Why are they standing there? Because they did not receive the grace of God and were not saved. Right. They could have been saved, but they didn't get saved. There'll be uh, small, like good wives and church members who'll stand at that great white throne judgment because they didn't come the way that God had provided through the Lord Jesus Christ alone. Amen. There'll be many who thought that they could have got there because they were moral and because they gave money to the offering plates and helped poor folks, but you don't get there by doing those good things. You get there by the sacrifice of Jesus Christ alone. Yeah. Putting faith in Him. If you're saved, uh, you'll not stand there. But if you, are, if you aren't saved, you will. You'll hear Him say, Depart from me, I never knew you. You'll stand in the light of his holiness and every word, every secret thought will be made manifest and the light of holiness will shine upon it. You'll be judged according to your works, it says in verse 13. I'm glad as a Christian I don't have to be judged according to my works. That'll be a terrible time. I don't want my skeletons drug out of the closet. 
But all the lost will have every skeleton, every bone, every phalange will be drawn out of that closet. They'll be judged according to their works. You say, preacher, won't Christians have to stand for their works? No, they won't. Amen. It's all been washed away by Christ's blood. Amen. That's the option you have. But let's move on. And I'm about done. Uh, all of hell is caught up in a second resurrection. Now we talked about the rapture. That's the first resurrection. That's the, re that's the resurrection where we get bodies like Jesus and we fly up to meet him in the air and have a grand reunion. The second resurrection is when uh, those that are dead spiritually are called out of hell. And I can imagine as they, uh, they begin to come up out of hell, they're probably thinking, finally, I've done my time. Finally, it's over. But no, it, it's not over. Maybe some of them think, well, I'll get to finally plead my case before God and, and show him that I don't deserve to be here. But the fact of the matter is we all deserve to be there. It's only by grace and merited favor that we're not there. I use this verse a lot, but this verse certainly uh, uh, is set at this great white throne judgment. If you, if you read it and think about it, Matthew chapter 7, verse 22. Daniel mentioned it in the Sunday school this morning. It said Jesus is speaking. He says, many will say to me, who's sitting on the throne? Jesus is. He said, many will say to me. In that day, what day? The day we just read about in Revelation, that great white throne judgment. Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name, and thy name cast out devils? In thy name done many wonderful works. And this is what he says. He said, I'll profess unto them, I never knew you depart from me. They said, we did all these things. We don't deserve to be in, in fire. We don't deserve judgment. But Jesus said, I don't know you. Depart. Why well, don't he know them? Well, in Revelation 20 it says, he looks in his book for a name. You ever notice that? Why is he looking for a name? See if he knew them. See if he had a relationship with them. Their names are not there. He says, I don't know you. Depart from me. It's a terrible time. And some think they, they'll put up a case. These people try to. Maybe they think they got a better case than these people do. I hope this ain't talking about you. Jesus is talking about some, some specific people. It hadn't happened yet. But as they try to defend themselves, the evidence just piles up and piles up. I mean, God sees everything. He knows everything. There's books that are open, books full of things you did wrong. You've got no advocate either. You know a Christian, it says of a Christian that we have an advocate with a father. The word advocate means a lawyer. Somebody to defend us. So when the devil comes and talks to the father and says, well, I tell you what, old Byerly, he did this. He just said, he's one of mine that's taken care of. I'm his lawyer. You don't have no advocate if you're lost at this great white throne. Listen to what Romans 3, 19 says. It says, Now we know that what things soever the law saith, that's the Bible, it saith to them that are under the law, that every mouth may be stopped Amen. and all the world may become guilty before God. They're going to try to put up a defense, but their mouths are going to be stopped because this book right here is going to speak against them. Right. They've broken these laws. That's why it says in Psalm 1-5, the ungodly shall not stand in judgment. That means they'll try to stand. They'll try to put up a case, but they won't stand in that case. It'll be for naught. The word of God will testify against them. See, John 3-18 says, He that believeth on the Son is not condemned, but he that believeth not is condemned already because he hath not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. Amen. You're not even waiting for that judgment. You're already condemned. This, this, this uh, great white throne is just going to show you why you're condemned. The law says the wages of sin is death. All of sin that comes short of the glory of God, you will not be able to stand in that judgment. But you don't have to stand there. You can be saved. You can have it all washed away now by Christ's precious blood. But let's look lastly at what happens in this great white throne. A book is open. The last book. And that's the book of life. And if you've never been saved, your name won't be written in it. And the Bible says you'll be cast in the lake of fire. What an awful day that'll be. If you could just have a glimpse of this judgment, I believe there'd be nobody in this congregation who would leave here unsaved. If you could see it with your eyes. 
You would cry out from where you are, Lord, save me. And what is the verdict? Well, the verdict is guilty on every single one who stands there. Look what it says in verse uh, 15. Whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast in the lake of fire. Did you see that? Let me tell you what it don't say. It don't say whoever was judged unworthy was cast in the lake of fire. It doesn't say that, does it? It doesn't say whoever didn't do enough good works while they were on earth was cast in the lake of fire. It didn't say that. It didn't say uh, that whosoever uh, uh, didn't keep the Sabbath was cast in the lake of fire. It said whosoever's name was not written in the book of life was cast in the lake of fire. Now I'm going to tell you what happens. The moment you trust Christ as your Savior, believing he died on the cross and rose uh, from the grave, when you call upon him, trust him, he writes your name in the last book of life. It's there. If you was able to go up to heaven on vacation and you was able to walk into that room where that book is and you open it up uh, uh, many, many years ago, you'd see Brother Tim Townsend's name written there. My name's there. Is yours? If your name's not there, it's too late for you. Bad enough when you die lost and lift up your eyes in torment. It's another thing to stand at this great white throne. You say, I'll burn up, preacher. No, you won't. In Revelation chapter 14, verses 10 through 11, it says the smoke of their torment ariseth up forever. That's what it says. You say, well, we'll have a party down there. You ain't going to have a party down there. No. The Bible says it's a place of wailing and gnashing of teeth. You better be saved. And the Bible is very clear. It lasts forever. How about you save people? I'm going to close right here. I, I promise you. You have heard enough, I'm sure. But there's going to be one thing I didn't mention here. I was talking about saved people. They won't stand in judgment. But you know what? We're going to be there. We're not going to be judged, but we'll be there. Now, can you imagine standing there as a witness to this great white throne judgment and seeing somebody you didn't witness to have to walk up and stand before God? Somebody you had an opportunity to tell them how to be saved and you didn't tell them, and then you see them walk up before this great white throne. Perhaps, perhaps they might look to you and say, why didn't you tell me? Why didn't you warn me of this place? If you're there as a witness, that certainly could be the case. I don't read of it here in the Bible, but if we're there, it certainly could happen. What would your answer be? So I tell you, we need to take this thing serious. Make sure the people we know are saved. The Bible goes on to say, too, that he wipes away all tears from their eyes. That's right after this judgment. Could it be those tears are being shed because the saints of God didn't do everything within their power to see those folks who are standing there saved? Certainly could be. So as we go into the invitation time, I want you to consider these things. Are you saved? Are you going to heaven when you die? Or are you standing at this great white throne judgment? Christian, consider this. Are you doing everything you can to see uh, that the people that you love and the people that are close to you, that this world knows Christ as their Savior? Let's pray.